Thank you very much. We have a hand up from Phil Watson. Start to ask your question, please, Phil. Oh, oh, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Oh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Doctor. <coughs> I'm curious, <coughs> and I live in Barnsley in South Yorkshire, and we have a, a metro mayor in Mr Jarvis. Now, when you compare the powers that Mr Jarvis has, they're nothing compared to what the new mayor for West Yorkshire will have for the transport and many issues. I'm particularly interested in what you had to say about health and well-being and and the effect transport has on people's health. Uh, what would be the priorities of transport? Would it be the economy or people's health? Uh, and uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, transport is all over the place. You mentioned all these different bodies, transport authorities, transport executives, uh, elected mayors, health and well-being, but there's no connectivity, is there, with local government? And perhaps these metro mayors may bring them together a little bit and knock heads together. I, I was, <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> this is what metro mayors are supposed to, are actually doing it as well, knocking heads together, forcing people to sit down together. I know the example from Greater Manchester is that Andy Burham, who's the, our metro mayor, is asking people from Highways England, from the Network Rail or relevant other transport authorities in the area to sit down together once a month on a table to talk, you know, what's happening. And I think this is what Transport for the North is doing as well, because it is what essentially is does a bottom up approach to a partnership, to bringing people to together, share good evidence across across the different areas. And one thing that I would like to see more of it is metro mayors are doing great jobs, city regions are doing great job. What about areas that doesn't have a metro mayor? Like the Carnford in Lancaster is, is a small town which needs a huge investment into in the in the transportation system to make its transportation healthy because 80% of people are just driving their cars because there's no viable public transportation. What about other other shire counties where it doesn't have metro mayors or strong, you know, strong advocates for the areas? So I'm hoping to see those areas are actually getting a bit of a spotlight as well in the future. Can I just ask another question there, please, Doctor? Um, it depends on Tom yeah. if you have time. Well, I'm, um, I'll be very I'm afraid, uh, afraid we have to uh, move on to our, our next presentation, okay. unfortunately. But th thank you very much for your uh, for your question, Phil. I've noticed there's, there's several comments uh, in the chat. Um, what we'll do is collate these and uh, put them to our speakers after the uh, meeting has finished today. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation today, Charla. Happy to answer any questions or you know, comments on the chat as well later. I'm, I'm here till two. Thank you. Our second presentation today is from Dr. Hadi Arbabi, who's a lecturer in the Department of Civil and Structural Engineering at the University of Sheffield. I'll hand over to you now, Hadi. Thanks. I'm not sure whether if we had a screen share um, and a few guests. Uh, my apologies, it should be enabled as it's coming up at uh, your end. Yeah, I don't seem to actually see. Uh, uh, you have noticed over a conversation? Yeah, I think uh, that's the case. The slide. You, uh, very much. Matt, if you don't mind telling me what to uh, on to the next, then I will just to share your presentation slides now. Hello everyone, I'm some minor myself with sharing. I'm just up to get the other with meantime. 
Uh, I'm Chef, the region. Um, my output is too the Lex Traveler uh, and what we just going to do a then uh, 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 this is just to be related. Tom, our result. Please, um, I, I can't. That issue is. So, apologies. Um. Where we um, the perspective on the economic um, last years, uh, and this has started to kind of um, um, tone down a bit. There was a, a massive push on the intercity agglomeration through transport uh, back in uh, starting in 2014. Um, and um, the observation that the uh, productivity in the north was lagging massively behind uh, that of uh, the south, particularly London, and the idea that if we get more people mixing uh, the across the north, we'll be able to achieve those uh, economic potential. Uh, now, all oh, right, great. Uh, if we go and slide in. So effectively, the way um, what's what has always been implicit behind these uh, policy and mobility backgrounds were uh, are a uh, um, abstraction of the city as and, and its economic output as the outcome of all the individual uh, interactions that take place between uh, the inhabitants in the city. And so you could uh, write a parallel into the economic performance that you have in the city as the count of uh, interactions that take place between people and the individual outcome of those interactions that are invariably a function of the skills and the uh, you know the specialty and the uh, employment uh, status of those individual involved in that interaction and um, and also uh, the distance these people have from one another and the mobility services that are available to effectively facilitate overcoming those distances. Um, if we go to the second, uh, next slide, um, and for that, uh, it's uh, it's this tension between the network that is uh, interactions between people and the network that is the uh, physical infrastructure that, uh, that, that that's embedded inside the city and uh, incorporates those services and um, uh, mobility uh, modes that enables the movement through that social uh, interaction network. Now, this is also uh, uh, where any of those modes could be embedded. It could be the walking over the network, it could be uh, road-based uh, public transport, it could be rail-based public transport, it the, the, the collection of these modes. And so this is how we usually approach uh, modeling uh, movement, density, and uh, uh, economic agglomeration effects. Uh, and th th this is um, the underlying reasons why uh, that's uh, the, the usual observation that larger cities do better or more productive and or resource efficient. Um, these are the assumptions where those come from. So um, over the last four years, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, 
using these type of uh, arguments on cities, what we've been able to uh, observe uh, for cities has been that uh, most of the um, arguments about uh, lack of mobility and transport, uh, particularly in the north of England, but throughout the country, uh, for the exception of London, uh, is that these uh, the, this lack of mobility occurs across uh, spatial scales. It's a problem inside uh, neighborhoods, it remains a problem inside cities, and then it's a problem across the larger metropolitan areas or regions. And uh, the, the, um, the, the benefit that London has is effectively having uh, that uh, uh, transport infrastructure and mobility that uh, enables those transports rather than just the pure uh, numbers of uh, inhabitants. Um, but what that also means for North of England is that the larger intercity schemes that were in vogue uh, a few years back and uh, kind of uh, where how uh, Transport for the North uh, came about, um, while very much necessary, uh, will not do the thing that's expected from them unless the intercity needs for mobility, which we observe uh, at recurring uh, spatial scales, uh, have also been addressed beforehand, uh, which brings out the point that the um, what's required for uh, at least a um, productivity-driven uh, uh, um, approach for planning for transport is the multimodal and concurrent uh, deployment of that infrastructure and provisions of mobility, uh, whatever the transport modes may be. Uh, so this is agnostic to whether uh, you're advocating walking or uh, taking the bus or cars. It's the lack of those connect, you know, lack of the capacity that enables those uh, movements. And um, the figure that you're looking at is the exercise we went through trying to recreate uh, uh, a rational pairing of the city regions uh, with uh, agnostic from the, you know, the um, cultural or uh, boundary, the administrative boundaries from what regions have the transport and the population counts to enable one another uh, for that productivity. Um, those are effectively the patterns you see at different uh, distances and the uh, different methods of trying to create those, but uh, they do uh, give rise to recurring patterns uh, situations in, in the Midlands and the North and the rational sharing in uh, uh, the third place and country, but would from uh, that gradual. Addition of the internet and uh, the Now, coming from uh, the need stuff that uh, we have the tool to bench individual things if you hear this or do the other. Based on very cost benefit methodology, we have a way by work out uh, long term or desired out for benchmark uh, option. Have a method to construct those. Uh, uh, system. What was part of the undertook last uh, the inside network? Um, we uh, um, by using existing network. Road is that's okay, and uh, traffic information. Uh, uh, network city for the city and over the existing transport infrastructure, 
um, to find the uh, effectively the version of the city that, ha that, that has the uh, maximum number of social interactions. Now, this is not something to plan uh, and enforce, mostly because of all the other side issues to uh, all the considerations that you have for planning, uh, be it uh, health and well-being and the fact that we usually have a finite amount of uh, um, resources to access infrastructure, infrastructure, but it does provide that blueprint towards which over long uh, over long term the planning of the city should perhaps move. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, so th this is what quickly we uh, piloted for uh, for the neighborhoods in Sheffield, uh, looking at two ways of trying to uh, move these neighborhoods around based on whether uh, we let them, uh, we, we shuffle them around within the boundaries of the city, or we only shuffle them around within 50% uh, uh, distance of their existing neighbors as you know, as Sheffield exists in space currently. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Now, we had the, uh, you know, uh, we had a very um, uh, trivial observation that uh, denser cities perform better. Uh, the, the denser your, your city is, the more likely you are to enjoy those, uh, uh, a larger number of uh, social interactions. Now, this does have, uh, implications as to what transport infrastructure you would then require to uh, deploy to minimize the congestion problems, but it supports the active uh, uh, transport and uh, the modes by walking, mostly because it's minimizing the distances over which those, uh, uh, that that mobility needs to take place. But um, if you'll go to the next slide, um, the, the, the main part is that if uh, longer distance uh, mobility is more difficult. So if that's the thing we cannot address or long-term uh, uh, have difficulty addressing, uh, the optimi the, that, optimi that optimized layout of uh, neighborhoods and where things are in terms of land use uh, and um, uh, skills and dem demographic, has the uh, much more important role to play in the uh, increase of the productivity potential. So uh, effectively the numbers you're looking at is the um, ratio of the number of interactions as a proxy of uh, economic output when we have optimized, uh, well, when we have sorted the neighborhoods in places that will that'll increase the number of interactions versus where they are in space uh, normally. And if, uh, movement over longer distances are more difficult, uh, you'll get a larger return by putting neighborhoods in specific places uh, as you do it. Right, if we go to the next slide. Um, the, the other thing uh, was, we, had, we, we see when we try to optimize the spatial layout that uh, a homogenous deployment of uh, mixed use planning uh, becomes beneficial. Now, this is uh, in support of both the density and the um, active transport and uh, walking, mostly because it, while maintaining that density, having uh, having the more diffuse, uh, let's say, city center or the uh, the um, traditional concept of city center means amenities are homogeneously distributed across cities keeping everyone uh, in, in a um, in closer distance with, uh, with the others. So we effectively uh, distribute those number of interactions and desegregate the, um, the activities across the city. Um, and uh, th those are, um, so the, the, the figures uh, you're looking at are the, uh, uh, the, the first one on the left is the, uh, density of interactions at uh, different neighborhoods uh, with the yellow being the uh, the highest number of interactions, which is really just highlighting where the city center in Sheffield is. Uh, and the other two uh, are the change in the distance of individual neighborhoods from the other neighborhoods for the two different scenarios. And uh, what we see in both of them is uh, we effectively, uh, uh, our long-term planning is 
redistributing that city center across uh, the rest of the neighborhoods rather than having it concentrated uh, at the core inside the city. Uh, if we go to the next slide, and finally, uh, uh, the observation was that um, the the, the most the uh, highest return in terms of that uh, potential for productivity or increased number of interactions uh, because of this exercise happen in areas that currently uh, are lower in terms of uh, educations or skills in demographic. Uh, now we can interpret this either as uh, well um, when you when you do optimize the spatial layouts, uh, you are trying to distribute the benefits uh, across, and it does that for uh, neighborhoods uh, that are disadvantaged uh, more, uh, but also highlights that uh, we can we can overcome some of these uh, mobility problems, well, some of the productivity problems, not just through mobility, but uh, investments in infrastructure and education and the skills elsewhere. So it's not just about um, that connectivity. Um, anywho, so this has been uh, the work that we have piloted. Uh, if we go to the next slide, what we are currently working on uh, since the, uh, specifically the proof of concept works in uh, terms of having a planning blueprint that doesn't require as, uh, as much uh, input data as we usually use for land use and transport interaction models. Uh, but provides a big picture uh, view of uh, where things might need to be if we are uh, thinking uh, of uh, devising uh, uh, infrastructure, particularly transport and mobility uh, options. So uh, the, the plan for future work we have, and this is where we, we are looking, trying to connect with uh, the stakeholders and or uh, um, local planning um, organizations is to extend the geographic boundaries and try to wrap this into a nested social interaction uh, model across the travel work areas in the north and uh, the overall uh, uh, what used to be the northern powerhouse uh, as, as a whole and try to look at that uh, mix of uh, reorganizing the spatial uh, structure over the region. And also some refining of the modeling of the distances and services by which we are uh, enabling uh, that uh, mobility. The, and finally, the other thing this uh, allows is the um, reformulation of these penalty costs in terms of uh, decarbonization and emissions rather than just um, the economic output. Um, I think that's about it. Sorry, I think I might have overrun a bit, but uh, do. Uh, get in touch uh, with me if any of this was uh, was of interest. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hadi. Uh, I see there's a hand up from uh, Shimuel in the uh, in the section there. So if you'd like to ask your question, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. I am not an academic, as you probably guess, but I am interested in what these academic theories on transport and the environment have on the on, on the population. I'd like to, have you, has there been any analysis of the effect of super tram in Sheffield in the 30 or so years it's been in existence, super tram, uh, has it had any positive effects on transport in Sheffield, between the universities and the city centre and the outlying villages? And as a final point, uh, I'd like to have any, some analysis on bus services to outskirts of the villages such as Workley and, and places like that, because trying to get to Workley village without a car is virtually impossible. Right, so we haven't specifically looked at uh, super tram per se, but what I can tell about the uh, um, super tram um, and rail-based uh, um, uh, tram or metro services overall is we've, they've, they've been in decline and they've been in decline in cities where we observe these mobility problems. So if you were to look at the extent of uh, uh, intra-city rail network uh, mobility that's available, uh, 
we have actually cut services in Sheffield uh, 1940s onwards. And the ones that are doing better behind London, which has the, the one that's the, the exemplary of the type of uh, 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 internal uh, transport, uh, uh, well, mobility services, are now uh, the Greater Manchester area and the, serv and the service that Guilty. runs... That, 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 that runs in uh, Newcastle area. I guess. You, I guess. Thank, thank you very much for your question. Uh, the next question we have is from uh, Shimiol, which came up as a hand up, please. I'm, I'm afraid we're not uh, not currently able to hear you. I'm afraid. Uh, had a I want uh, to ask uh, my question. Uh, I want uh, to ask you about the uh, difference uh, uh, between uh, uh, accessibility uh, to transport uh, and uh, transport uh, infrastructure uh, uh, of uh, poor uh, and uh, low socioeconomic uh, uh, populations. Uh, in uh, North uh, England, if uh, we are, have uh, any uh, any difference uh, between accessibility to transport uh, systems uh, uh, between uh, poor and uh, wealthy uh, population. Thank you. Um, right. So the, the, the pilot project I uh, I was talking uh, uh, talking uh, walking you through doesn't uh, doesn't look at uh, the uh, what I, what I believe is more the affordability of that mobility uh, rather than the accessibility. It looks at where things are in space currently. Uh, figuring in the affordability is on our uh, list of things to add to the model. Uh, at, at the moment, it's really captured in the, um, in the fact of the skills and income levels of the neighborhoods uh, rather than the, uh, particularly the distance and the infrastructure between them. But what I can... Uh, uh, say on the topic of affordability um, is mostly on the, it, it's the change in modes that, um, okay, that that being in a poorer or um, um, richer neighborhood enforces uh, right and so for example in taking Sheffield the bus services usually exist uh, relatively agnostic of whether or not it's a rich or poor neighborhood. Uh, it becomes an affordability of whether the individuals in the neighborhood can afford uh, the services that exist, and the fact that if you're in a richer neighborhood, you're less likely to actually be using those services. Thank you very much, Hadi. Um, I have one final question for you, which has come up in the chat, which is a question from Felicity uh, Heathcote Smart, which is on if uh, actor network theory features in your model for analysis. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? The question if uh, actor network theory features in your model or analysis. I'm not sure if that's, that's an approach you're, uh, you're familiar with or if that's an approach yeah, you're familiar with. Yeah, um, not, uh, not in its uh, um, effectively um, formulation in social sciences. Uh, uh, actor network theory uh, does have resemblances to social interaction models we use in social physics, but it does not... Uh, our models, the social physics models, uh, in their simple, in the in this most simplified form, which is what we used for this trial, do not capture the hierarchy of uh, effectively governance interactions between different types of actors. If that makes sense, they uh, effectively look look at individuals as the individual is given demographic rather than belonging to particular classes that interact differently. Thank you very much, Hadi. Uh, apologies to anyone who hasn't yet uh, had a chance to ask their question. I'm afraid uh, in the interest of time, we have to move uh, on to our next presentation, which is from uh, Joyce Little, who's a professor of public leadership and enterprise at Northumbria University, and John Shutt, who's a professor of public policy and management also at Northumbria University. Uh, Joyce and John, if you are able to share your slides, please do so. Uh, if not, I have your, have your slides downloaded so I can load those up to a, 
avoid any technical issues. I think I'm doing uh, it now, Tom. Are they there? Can you see they them? are indeed. Thank yeah, you very okay. much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Just to say that um, nice picture of Newcastle there for you. We do have quite a lot of slides, but we won't be going through them line by line. We're just using them as a prompt. Um, thank you very much for inviting us. Um, let me just move on to the next one. Oops. Yeah, we've already said that it's myself and John Chuck. I'll do the first half, then hand over to John, and then I'll, I'll do some sweeping up later. Just to say that John and I are not transport specialists. We're both regional and local government specialists, strategy and leadership, and John used to be a planner in a past life, and I was a civil servant. Whoops, oh, they're gone. Where's the slides gone? Uh, we can still see your slides, Joyce, if that's Oh, right, I can't see helps. them. I'm sorry, I can't see them myself. Uh, if you would like, I could take control of your slides and uh, yes, operate them please. now. Yes, I can't see them now, they're gone. Okay, we will. Oh, they're back, they're back. On to your third yeah, okay. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today then is uh, complex government and um, whether it's fit for purpose at the moment. We'll touch on levelling up <coughs> local industrial strategies and building back better. <coughs> what we want to do is offer suggestions for TFN. Uh, there's some of our work and at the, the back of the presentation we also have an appendix with some other work that you might be interested in. And uh, just a couple of them here. Uh, the book we did on the Northeast uh, after Brexit and its impact on policy. <clears throat> We've had a couple of special editions. I'm losing my slides again. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. I'm really sorry about this. No problem at all. We're currently on slide number four, which is uh, showing your. Yeah, uh, I, can't, I can't see them. I don't know what's happening. Not a problem. If you'd like to uh, share those. Share those again, or I can do so and drive your slides for you, whichever you prefer. If you could share them, they're, they're not coming up. Sorry. We, we can we can see them now. We've reached I, it. I can't, the screen now. I can't see them now. Okay, not a problem at all. I'll uh, just load up your presentation. Now. I do apologise, everyone, for the uh, technical issues we've been having this afternoon. Um, hopefully, these won't interrupt the uh, presentation any further. Uh, Joyce, that, back yeah. to you. We can see your, okay. your slide there. Okay, so moving on then uh, to um, uh, share the GDP. You can see the northeast at the bottom there. This is 2018. However, things may have gotten worse under COVID. Um, this slide is about fragmentation. I don't intend to go through this all, just to say that since 2010, English local governance and governance in general is probably the most fragmented in the world, um, to such an extent that people working in the system uh, don't even understand it, and also uh, they're having to join up the dots for themselves. Just to highlight uh, three or four on here, the first speaker said we have lots and lots of stop and start policy, which is absolutely true, in economic and in the social policy world. We've got uh, fragmentation in funding um, and in bidding, very uh, you know competitive deal making, and there is no single pot. People have been lobbying for this for quite some time, but we still don't have any joined up missing uh, funding and bidding. Uh, fragmentation in um, in data sources as well, and uh, we're at the lowest level since 2010 on any research and evaluation of what's happening at the local level in terms of impact. And one key thing for me, obviously from a civil service background, is um, uh, fragmentation of accountability. So in actual fact, it's very difficult to understand <coughs> who's responsible for what and, uh, you know, who's, who has the legitimacy, et cetera. And uh, we do believe that the uh, mayors have been bypassed in some of the recovery planning uh, phases. So it's very difficult to understand who's doing what. So fragmentation rules. Um, so we've got very, very complicated uh, governance in every policy area, um, including in transport. So in every policy area, you have hundreds of um, statutory and non-statutory agencies involved. Um, the government has uh, declared that uh, combined authorities and mayoral, um, uh, mayoral arrangements will be the preferred, um, uh, the preferred uh, form of governance. Um, 
despite some of the county councils and the unity authorities uh, lobbying for um, other forms of governance. Uh, so in effect, we have little coterminosity. Uh, we have a growth in uh, wicked issues. And uh, because of the dominance uh, previously in economic policy, the core cities have dominated the agenda. John's going to be talking later about levelling up uh, in more detail. But one, one thing I would say at the end of this slide is that um, there is a lot of uh, lack of institutional memory, particularly when the RDAs and government offices were abolished. And uh, I refer to this as organisational amnesia. So what's happening is we get new agencies started up, then they, they, they get disbanded, they get abolished. There's no kind of passing on of the, the knowledge or the, the information, and there's a lack of uh, history and amnesia. Uh, so here we have, um, uh, you know, the, the combined authorities. Devolution is still not clear. We're told that there's a white paper coming out 2021, but there's also a suggestion that maybe that um, maybe it'll be combined into leveling up again, uh, leveling up um, um, uh, legislation as well. So what we would suggest is maybe we need to look to um, the, the European models of um, devolution, but uh, it's all up in the air at the moment. Um, in far, as far as left, left are concerned, there's a review of lefts going on at the moment. Will they be abolished or will they be um, absorbed into combined authorities? None of us know. Um, it's just very, very complicated. And I'll come shortly to, you know, funding uh, and what have you. But it's very, very, um, very, very complicated. Looking at finances, it's very difficult, actually, to get any sort of sense of how um, combined authorities are being uh, funded. And uh, we can't get concrete figures, whether it's uh, transport or anything else or any other policies. We've got lots and lots of um, uh, this doesn't include all of them. Uh, we, this, John and I did this uh, with some work from um, uh, with some help from the uh, House of Commons Library. Uh, but just to update this a little bit, there is a devolution deal for Sheffield that's just been agreed with 350 million pound um, local growth fund. Sorry, 350 million pound local growth fund. 166 million pound transforming cities fund and a two million pound capacity building fund. Uh, the North of Tyne combined authority as well has recently received two million for capacity building as well. But as far as we know, uh, we're not sure what's happening in terms of local uh, local growth fund or transforming cities fund. But we use this just to show you just how complicated things are. It's very difficult to get a handle on how these bodies are being funded, given the stop and start policies, the stop and start funding, and the stop and start uh, stop and start bidding process as well. So I'm going to I'm going to hand you over to John now to talk about the Northern Powerhouse and transport policy in particular, and then I'll sweep up at the end when John's finished. Over to you, John. Tell me when you want me to move the slides. Uh, I, I can I can take control. Uh, okay, John. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, um, Can you, John? Okay. Uh, actually, can you put the slides back up? I seem to have lost them for some reason. Yeah, it's not yeah. easy, is it? Let me try again, John. Yes, yes, I will do. Um, there we go. Do you want me to manage them, John? Yes, please, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so if we go go back to the Northern Yeah, Center. apologies for this. Let's go on to number 11. Where we were. Yeah. Um, okay, John. I think we've said that, you know, the usefulness of this group is that we need to sort of keep up to date with the data and, and how to use it and analyze it. And I'm just sort of starting to draw your attention to the deprivation, deprivation data for 2019, which uh, was only just recently released and begins to show, um, you, you know, that um, how, how bad things are moving between 2015 and 19 in the Northern Powerhouse area. And again, um, perhaps insufficient attention to what this shows in the Tees Valley, for example, and, and uh, the fact that sort of Blackburn and Darwin uh, and Hartlepool have joined the top 10 most deprived local authorities. And 
you know, sort of thinking that through and what that implies for local government um, is often sort of, you know, we're lagging sometimes in using this data uh, and thinking it through in policy making terms. If we move on, Joyce. Um, so we've got the Northern Powerhouse and Transport for the North and Transport for the North doing a good job presenting their business case. We now sort of have to ask the question, sort of, is there going to be continued policy support from central government for Northern Powerhouse and Transport for the North in this next period? Because so far, we're beginning to see a sort of roadback from some of these sort of pan-regional concepts. And this is quite worrying. And I think we ourselves have got a lot of responsibility to make sure that we increase collaboration across the three northern regions. Move on, Joyce. Um, so we've got the integrated rail plan um, and um, it's essential that sort of we get a grip of both Northern Powerhouse Rail and HS2 integration. And a lot of these big capital schemes are receiving uh, a lot of scrutiny, but we've got to make sure that um, we understand how things are proceeding with phase two and what the implications are going to be um, for uh, the North and the, the, the North uh, issues are explored in terms of looking at the, the implications on growth. Joyce, can you move on? Um, and here we've got Transport for the North's sort of key views about what they're going to deliver for the next two years. And, um, you know, a focus on rebuilding passenger numbers after COVID, working with the train operators and DFT and network rail to get clarity on the rail investment plans. And clearly the forthcoming spending review is going to be critical and um, we need to complete uh, the investment in Northern Power, Power Rail um, and agree um, what the priorities are as we move into the next phase of development. So at the same time, um, North, Transport for the North is consulting on the decarbonisation strategy and increasing the kind of work that it's doing for COP26 and looking at uh, the freight strategy and the logistics strategy for the North. And again, uh, all of this work's very important, but what we're witnessing um, is, uh, if you move on, Joyce, um, that, um, you know, there's a sort of a, a reaction occurring in planning um, where the planning reforms are sort of undermining uh, some of the integration work that's going on. Um, and, uh, you know, a warning just this week from CPRE and Sustrans and Transport Planning Society um, about the, the, the decisions that are being made in the private sector. Um, and, you know, many new housing, which is a lot of the targets are being relaxed and a lot of the sites are being built in places that don't serve public transport well, and they're inaccessible and only accessible by car. And there's, there's not, there's insufficient sort of attention to these issues. Um, uh, because of the lack of integration. Now, I'll draw your attention to the excellent work of Alistair Baldwin in Newcastle and Kelly Shuttleworth at the Institute of Government and the recent pamphlet that they've done on how governments are using transport evidence. But again, we've been talking about it today, you know, the DFT, um, you know, it's there's a lack of integration between the rail plans, the road plans, aviation, maritime, and the bus cycling and walking plans. And although um, the new sort of attention to bus and cycling is very welcome, we've got a big problem about how we develop greater coordination between transport for the north, between the mayoral combined authorities, and we've just had a new mayor elected for Leeds City Region. Um, so um, we're beginning to see 11 uh, of the 13 combined authorities get some shape, but it's exceedingly complex and difficult. And you need to think about the nature of the different combined authorities. We've seen a lot of attention 
to the the excellent work that Ben Houchen's been doing, uh, trying to trying to build the combined authority in the Tees Valley and um, the rail integration plan that the Tees Valley Combined Authority has done is is very good and we we need to sort of uh, do more of this and think that through. But generally, the problem is that the combined authorities don't work together readily enough and they don't work together strongly enough with transport for the north so we need to pay attention to some of these details now in the northeast um we've got this particular problem of a combined authority for the tees valley run by conservative ben houchen and a new combined authority for north of time run by jamie driscoll the the the, the labor candidate um and that's the most the newest of the combined authorities um so it's still at an early days and it's not got enough resources but in the middle of the northeast we've got no clear view about the future of the combined authority um there is a combined authority it's called NECA, but there's no clear view about uh where that's proceeding to uh and how to how to get a long-term settlement for the northeast so this of course makes strategic planning extremely difficult and then on top of this um we've got to cope with the situations we come out of covid um and the strains that that's producing on the public transport system uh, and what the implications of that are so we'll move on joyce so covid recovery plans and building back better is the sort of mantra and there's a lot of work going on looking at the covid recovery plans that the combined authorities are bringing forward uh, but it's recognizing uh, how some of the the transport plans fit in with transport for the north and some of the priorities and in the recovery plans um, we're also seeing announcements so announcements about rail plans for example move on to us um uh which um are connected to the leveling up agenda and some of the announcements for example in the northeast the northumberland line announcement or the announcement about hartlepool to darlington uh rail investment that's expected um they're they're not necessarily sort of um well embedded into transport for the north thinking and we need to we need to increase the amount of collaboration that's taking place uh, as these schemes are announced so um we've got that we've got a whole range of new programs which uh, are coming in and which are being bid for and of course um we are we're we're always keen to sort of say what the combined authorities should do or what local government should do but there's a huge capacity problem uh inside local government in terms of the ability to bid for these funds and the amount of time it it takes up and leveling up fund is a good example uh of a fund that suddenly come on the scene and it's been highly critical in terms of the allocations but also um when you look at some of the requirements on the spend uh, and the impossibility of achieving spend in such short time scales um there are, are a lot of difficulties ahead uh in terms of reaching agreement on um which schemes are being prioritized um and there's a sort of a lack of clarity of purpose uh and partnership and again we've got to be wary of um, a view that you know uh trying to split the core cities off from the key cities uh and the and the secondary centers and again at the moment uh what's being played out is is very much sort of a view that you know it's the core the core cities have had too much resources uh and that the key cities need more resources um and that uh, somehow uh, interventions required to to provide for their direct needs without discussing the sort of implications of some of the decisions that are being made so um where we've got uh, a lot of new investment you know in a place like darlington with a new treasury campus 
coming forward, for example, with Amazon moving in as a key employer, employing a thousand people. Um, things are changing very dramatically, and it's important that the transport white the transport planning responds to these changes. Um, so um, we come back to you know the difficulties around the the sort of the devolution process and the lack of um, progress on it um, and um, the the real lack of progress on integrating policy. Um, the, there's no clear view about how transport uh, fits with economic and environmental policy and social policy at the moment. Um, and what Joyce and I are arguing is that um, if we want to shift some of the deep-seated deprivation in places like the Tees Valley, then uh, we've actually got to do a lot better job in this kind of policy integration. And until these issues get recognised by central government, uh, then we're going to be faced with uh, a lot of wasted time through a lot of new small initiatives. And we need initiatives which are uh, integrated, which are going to shift the, the, the problems in a fundamental way. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, okay. so just, like, just um, to summarise for the next couple of slides very quickly then, what we argue is we need a clear framework and lead from central government because there's still a lot of silo thinking, all the departments are working together well, everyone at the table, not just dominated by the core cities. We need better integration of programs, agencies, and policy integration rather than the stop and start. Uh, we need, uh, in order to get to build better back, and we certainly do need more data because once we've got the RDA going and, uh, you know, ONS people were drafted back, there's very little comprehensive data on the local areas. Local government association is probably the only area, the only department, the only agency that has a comprehensive overview, so we need to think about that. Um, we need a better, better strategic overview of the social and economic priorities after COVID. We need much more coordination between uh, TFN, Northern Powerhouse and local authorities. Um, and also the, 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 the local industrial strategies now seem to be morphing into the green plan uh, without much thought about that. And think about how all of these things uh, have implications for transport. Um, so joining up the dots more, um, listening to the Queen's speech yesterday, obviously there are more policies to come and we, we do need more evaluation uh, on impacts at local level. And the final one then is that the government's putting a lot of place, a lot of emphasis on place leadership. And it's a big issue because even if we get devolution, um, you know, that doesn't mean that the historical conflicts are going to go. And there's an issue of who's legitimately acting on behalf of the cities and on behalf of the areas. Um, we need collective leadership at different levels. And Northern Powerhouse is a very good concept, but we argue that its lack of accountability and communication is a real problem. So TFN plans for the next uh, period of 2030 definitely are a good start, but they need support from both central government and local government. And we'll stop there, but I think we're kind of on time now. Thank you. You are absolutely. Thank you uh, very much, uh, John and Joyce, for a very uh, interesting and very uh, detailed presentation there. Um, I noticed there are a, a couple of hands up in the chat. If I can go to John Horn, please. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for a really interesting presentation. Uh, I'm based in the bit of the northeast which you mentioned, which is sort of in the middle of the two of the two mayoral combined authorities. So I'm based in the northeast combined authority area. And um, I, I guess the point I'd make is there's one thing you actually didn't mention in your presentation, that is that every authority in, in the northeast, and indeed most across the north, have signed up to uh, very challenging targets to become carbon neutral. And I think all the seven authorities in the Northeast Combined Authority, North of Time Combined Authority, have set targets to be carbon neutral by 2030. And really, that's uh, that's only nine years away. It's an absolute massive to get from where we are now to, to carbon neutral by 2030 is an absolute <coughs> undertaking. And I guess my question is, or, or I guess my comment is that given all the institutional challenges that you, you've commented on and the sort of governance issues, 
how feasible is it that they could, you know, that under the present system we could get anywhere near achieving that transformation within just nine years? Well, I have a view on that that we can't, but John's our green guru, so I'm going to let John answer. <laughs> I, I'm not a green guru. I, I think it, it's clear that we can't and that you know, we've got to get a, a much better focus at regional and local level on these issues and we've got to get a much better focus at national level as well uh, on them and that um, you know it's all very well for sort of targets associated with COP26 and so on to be accelerated at a public relations level but trying to actually change policy inside a particular city and I've referred to the you know the the issue of the Northumberland line is a good example for example you know, the arrangements between Northumberland County Council and the North of Time Combined Authority and looking at uh, how the, the rail policies align with housing and with other uh, key, key investment strands, it, it, it's, it's not good enough. Um, you know, we need a much greater focus on integrated planning uh, for some of these major schemes. Thank you very much for your question, John. I'm afraid we're running slightly uh, behind time, so I'd say thank you very much to, uh, to John and to Joyce for your uh, very interesting presentation and for those who have been uh, commenting in the chat as well. As I mentioned previously, we'll be collating these and sending a copy of these along to our speakers for them to consider as well. So thank you very much for your presentation. Our final presentation today is from Emma Rossolik, who's a Senior Evidence and Analysis Officer at Transport for the North and from Matt Smith and Dr. Felicity Hiscoe Mark from Atkins. Uh, if I'd like to hand over to you, please. Great, thanks very much, John. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Senior Evidence and Analysis Officer at Transport for the North in the Economics and Research Team. Earlier this year, at Transport for the North commissioned two um, related projects. We were seeking to improve our understanding of the importance of the visitor economy in the north of England and the importance of transport um, for enabling and supporting the visitor economy. So together, these projects um, seek to ensure that across different aspects of Transport for the North's work, including our um, policy and strategy development, our program development, our modelling and appraisal, and development of business cases for transport investment. But across different aspects of our work, we can recognise the opportunities to support the North's visitor economy and the impact that this will have um, on, the, on the wider prosperity across the North. So one of these projects, uh, which is um, the focus of the presentation that we'll be sharing today, set out to establish a, a profile of the visitor economy across the North to understand the tra transport patterns associated with the visitor economy and ultimately to, um, to make um, some recommendations for transport-based solutions which can support the visitor's um, economy to uh, recover um, post the COVID pandemic and also to stimulate its future growth um, in a sustainable way. So today I'm joined by um, two of my colleagues, uh, Matt Smith and Felicity Heathcote-Marks from Atkins. And they are leading on this work for us um, and they'll be presenting an overview of the, of the study and some of our findings to date. So thank you very much both for joining us today and uh, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Emma. Thanks so much, Emma. That's great uh, introduction there to the project. So just some introductions um, to, from us, the Atkins team. Um, as, uh, as Emma mentioned, I'm Dr. Felicity Heathcote Mark, Technical Lead for Research and Behaviours uh, in the Atkins IMFT practice, which is Intelligent Mobility and Smart Technologies. Um, I have a, a PhD in ethnography and organisation studies, uh, was, was at Manchester Business School doing some teaching there before coming over to Atkins about four years ago. 
um, Matt Smith is also on the call with us today and will be uh, taking us through um, a lot of the slides Matt Stay Consulting and uh, Qualitative Research Specialist um, who has completed a Masters in Qualitative Research and Human Geography. So uh, our team is, is quite a bespoke um, team. We comprise research specialists across a range of techniques, uh, including those on the screen there. Um, we, we're, we're both me and Matt based in Manchester, very much rooted in the uh, northern district economy ourselves. Um, and we've delivered customer and stakeholder research work for Highways England quite extensively, DFT uh, and multiple local authorities, as well as supporting TFN to further develop the evidence base for this digital economy focused um, project. Um, we are um, the not two consultants for the Digital Economy and, and Transport Commission. Uh, next slide, please. So Matt's going to now take us through the um, uh, approach and methodology. Thanks, Felicity. Um, so on this study, we followed a very much mixed methods approach, uh, combining uh, research, uh, approach primary research and also secondary research. The project commenced with some secondary research, analysing some uh, quantitative data sets from the ONS, uh, the Department of Transport, Transport Focus and Visit Britain. And we also looked at uh, local data sources and analysed and interpreted those, such as uh, STEAM, the Scarborough Tourism Economic Assessment Model. And following on from the baselining work, um, secondary quantitative research, we have undertaken primary qualitative research, which has involved uh, focus groups with residents of the north of England, uh, focus groups with residents living outside the north of England, workshops with industry stakeholders to understand how the industry can be supported by Transport for North and their partners, and also uh, that has been underpinned by a uh, participant-led thematic approach to the analysis and iterative identification of findings from the data. And all this research has been underpinned by uh, an agreed uh, definition of the visitor economy, which we agreed with Transport for the North and the project steering group, which comprises of uh, members, uh, uh, stakeholders from the visitor economy. And the definition of the visitor economy, which we adopted, is that the visitor economy encompasses both the direct and indirect contribution to the economy resulting from a visitor travelling outside their usual environment for a holiday, leisure and event, business, retail and festivals. And the visitor economy encompasses all the things that attract visitors, so places and visitor attractions, the infrastructure which supports the visit while people are there, so transport uh, and uh, creating a sense of place and wayfinding infrastructure, and then services which cater for the needs of visitors such as hotels and restaurants and, and other, uh, other economic uh, activity. What we'll do first uh, is take you through some of the baseline findings to understand the, the geography and the scale of the north of England's visitor economy. Uh, this slide here shows uh, a couple of maps from our interim report which we submitted to Transport for the North uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the map on the left is showing domestic day visits to the north of England and it shows a very clear geography uh, to visits to the north of England with many visits being within uh, the, the main cities such as Manchester and Leeds, but also some hot spots around coastal areas such as Scarborough, Blackpool and also key uh, rural locations such as the Lake District and the Peak District. And our research identified that in 2019, there were a total of 420 million visits to the north of England. The majority of those were domestic visitors, but there were also a very important international visitor uh, economy market to the north of England. And that is largely concentrated around the north of England's, uh, what I call the north of England's central belt, um, cities such as Manchester and York, particularly uh, significant with that regard. On the right hand side, we've got uh, a map showing the most reported trip purpose for uh, visitors uh, within the domestic market who are traveling to the north of England from other parts of England. And again, there's a very clear geography to this. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, trips to visit friends and relatives within the uh, urban areas and the, the southwestern uh, qu quadrant of the north also the East Riding of Yorkshire and uh, around Durham and parts of the North East. Uh, business trips are the most popular reason for visiting the North of England to, uh, to South Yorkshire, West Yorkshire and Warrington. 
And then the North's more rural areas, such as North Yorkshire, Cumbria and Northumberland, are very popular holiday-based locations for people. We also examined uh, businesses and economic activity within the visitor economy. And here we found that there are th around 39,000 businesses employing 477,000 people in the north of England. Therefore, the visitor economy is a very important aspect of the North's uh, economic activity and therefore uh, is a very important sector to consider when uh, considering policy changes and interventions. The largest numbers of businesses and the largest amounts of employment in a, uh, in a, in a, in a number counting uh, perspective are in Manchester, Leeds, uh, Liverpool, uh, County Durham, East Riding of Yorkshire. Um, however, what is quite interesting is to look at the density of businesses, and that is uh, uh, outlined by the graph in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide, and that shows that uh, in the borough of Scarborough, the borough of Blackpool, and the borough of South Lakeland, uh, the visitor economy comprises of more than 10% of all businesses, which shows that while in absolute terms those areas might not have the largest numbers of businesses, those areas are actually most dependent upon the visitor economy and therefore this shows the importance of the sector to those areas and how the importance of the sector varies across the north of England. We also conducted some overall value calculations for the north of England's visitor economy and we found that there's a total visitor spend of over £21 billion in 2019 which creates a direct GVA contribution of around £10 billion, depending upon a uh, higher or lower estimate. And that creates a total net GVA contribution to the north of England of around £12 billion, again showing the significance and value of the sector to the region. In terms of travel patterns, we've analysed a range of data sources, including the International Passenger Survey and the National Travel Survey. And what we found is there are three key sets of flows, and those are from urban areas to other urban areas, for example, between Liverpool and West Yorkshire, or Manchester and West Yorkshire. There are also quite significant flows from urban areas to rural areas, for example, from Manchester. I think Matt may have just frozen on us. I think Matt is controlling the slides. Um, just give it a sec in case it comes back. Um, if not, we may have to ask um, Tom, do you have the slides to share? Or yes, else I, I can. OK, <laughs> that might be might be good. Hopefully Matt will be back with us very soon. One of those days for uh, slide problems, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely so. <laughs> Just loading up your uh, your presentation now, and I'll skip along to the uh, on to the relevant slide. Oh, thank you very much. That's great. I'm very sorry. We had a momentary power cut in my house um, I've managed to uh, get back on using the uh, mobile hotspot on my phone um, Tom did I hear you say you were going to share the slides or are the slides now showing again Tom's just going to share the slides um, Matt I think can you see that the, the right slide now just want to check Felicity can you hear me Yes, we can. We can hear yeah. that. Uh, your, your slide, uh, I believe, is on where you were before. I think it's still sharing on me. Ah, right. Cool. Sorry, I just pressed stop sharing then. I wasn't sure if you could see that. So let me uh, let me start sharing again. Um, is, that, is that visible? Uh, it's not yet to me, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, there we are. That's visible. Here we now. go. Thank you, Matt. Lovely. I well, I will start again um, on this slide and hopefully and there won't be. What I'll do is I'll just turn my video off just to save bandwidth, I think. Um, so as I was saying, there are three key uh, travel flows within the, uh, the north of England. So between the north's urban areas, for example, Liverpool to West Yorkshire and uh, Manchester to West Yorkshire. 
are also quite sizable flows between urban and rural areas, for example, between uh, Greater Manchester and Cumbria. But there are also uh, quite a few urban to coastal flows as well, from Manchester to Blackpool and over to Scarborough on the, uh, the east coast of the country. And also some, some smaller flows um, around uh, rural areas um, of the north too. We also looked at data on rail journeys, both within the north and to and from the north of England. So uh, what was quite interesting from our analysis of this data is the very different uh, levels of, uh, of uh, patronage of rail from a uh, intranorthern perspective compared to an internorthern perspective. So for journeys from outside the north into the north, surface rail has uh, a larger modal share than on average for long distance journeys within Great Britain as a whole at 17% versus 16%. However, for journeys within the north of England, um, rail only has a modal share of 8%, so half the modal share that it has outside uh, uh, compared to the uh, Great British average and also uh, for journey to and from north. And these findings were verified and further explored through focus groups of residents of the North and Great Britain. And uh, there were some quite interesting findings in our discussions during the focus groups and the base when traveling by rail within the North of England in comparison uh, by rail to and from the North of England. I'll hand back over to Felicity now and she will uh, take you through some of the primary research findings from our focus groups. Thanks very much, Matt. That's great. Just to let you know, your your sound is is isn't great. Um, so just letting you know that um, in case you can reconnect your your Wi-Fi. If we go to the I'll, next I'll slide. I'll try and do that. Yeah. Okay. If we just go to the next slide. Maybe the maybe it's not updating, Felicity. I am on a high level theme from the focus group. Ah, online. yeah. Oh, it's updating now. Here we go. Our focus group design. Um, so if we just go to the focus group design slide just for a moment. Um, so basically, everyone, the we what we did with the focus groups was we did um, six focus groups with northern residents and we split those between northern cities, northern towns and northern villages. Um, and then we did some, if you like, control group. Um, focus groups with non-Northern residents. Uh, so one from the cities, one from towns, and one from the villages all outside the North. Uh, this was really to give us um, a really broad perspective of what uh, Northern residents um, thought, felt, and what their um, current experiences were with traveling and um, in, in terms of their leisure journeys in the North, and then those who weren't from the North. Um, and there's a bit of information about um, the breakdown of the of the groups there. We we tried to make sure that we recruited a representative sample for um, the, the different demographics of the cities uh, and obviously a, a, an even gender split. And we made sure that we had some um, participants who had different kinds of, of mobility issues to provide that really important specific perspective. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is the high level themes of the focus group. So just going to run through some of these. We can see 10 key themes on the slide here. So number one, the north has got multiple multifaceted attractions for visitors. So this came up again and again. Lots of the northern and northern uh, northern and non northern residents talked about different reasons for visiting the north. So it wasn't just the culture or the countryside or the people or the food or any one thing. It was a, a whole multitude of things. Um, that were um, uh, multifaceted attractions for different kinds of visitor groups. Number two, there's a preference for shorter trips amongst residents. And number three, there's a preference for longer weekend um, or, or longer four to seven night stays for non-Northern residents. So we found um, this, again, was a recurring theme and was linked to um, the uh, transport issues for uh, people who lived further away from, from uh, northern visitor destinations, uh, not thinking it was worthwhile to visit for a day trip because they'd be spending too long on, on transport, um, also the value for money issues, um, and also people that live in the north have got a um, 
a higher uh, amount of knowledge about what attractions there might be. So it's easier for them to think to, uh, for, for just traveling for a day trip. Number four, cost was a real barrier for some groups um, that keeps them away from the north or keeps them from visiting the north more often. Um, so we'll, we'll talk more about that later as well. Um, number five, insufficient, easily accessible information about what the north has to offer as a region for visitors. Um, this also came up multiple times across the northern and non-northern um, focus groups. People wanted more information, but they didn't know where to find it. Uh, there's this reliance on private car trips to northern destinations, um, particularly for northern de destinations that might be in more rural areas. Um, the automatic uh, assumption is that we, we need a car or you need to travel by car um, or um, areas just aren't served very well by current public transport offerings. Uh, number seven, public transport poses a significant barrier to both northern and non-northern residents when considering that leisure trip to the north. So again, similar to number six, if public transport isn't there or you're not aware of what services are available, you're going to go straight to your car and assume that you're going to need to drive. Um, so that was a significant issue. Uh, number eight, there's a split between visitors who are keen to return to public transport post the COVID pandemic and those who are much more nervous to return, um, particularly to urban areas for leisure trips. So we thought that was a really interesting finding and something that we were going to need to keep an eye on, TFMs need to keep an eye on as, uh, as time goes on and as the COVID pandemic hopefully subsides, see if that demand can return. Number nine, accessibility and inclusivity of transport needs to be improved. Um, so again, this was particularly an issue for those um, focus group participants who had mobility um, issues or who, or who were older. Um, they uh, talked uh, again about um, that um, barrier to travelling by, by bus and by train um, because the, the, the services weren't as um, uh, user friendly for, for, for those who have got those additional needs um, and particularly thinking about more rural areas where um, it might not be easy to get a wheelchair or mobility scooter um, up, up to particular places of interest. And finally, number 10, there's this demand for increased and improved active travel and micro mobility travel options for visitors in the north. So um, again, we, we uh, carried out an activity with our focus groups to uh, get them to, to rank and to rate certain options that would encourage them to visit the north. And active travel and micro mobility travel was um, quite, quite an interesting one there for them. Mixed responses, um, but a lot of people would like to cycle more or to walk more or to use uh, you know, e-scooters or e-bikes if they were available. So there's a, there's a bit of um, uh, latent demand there and, and demand that's untapped. So we thought that was quite interesting. Next slide, please. Thank you. And here are just some quotes, um, first from the northern resident focus groups, and then we've got some from the non-northern. So these are just to bring the um, themes to life a little bit for you. So I won't read all of these out, but um, you can see how some of the, the key quotes reflect our key themes. So uh, somebody's saying that all the companies need to work together. Where I live, we've got these four bus companies, they need different tickets to uh, travel on different buses, not very joined up. Um, somebody also saying that they would really like to have um, a, a tourist pass that they could use across different destinations in the north, which again was something that came up again and again for our um, residents and, and non-northern residents in focus group that they would find quite attractive. Um, and then again, finding out to date and accurate information uh, isn't as good as it should be, especially in the rural areas where you need to have that confidence that public transport can get you there and get you home. Um, and somebody that was registered disabled and again, just saying that that was their, their biggest barrier to um, visiting some of these places that we were, we were talking about in the focus groups. Um, and then someone that's been using the electric scooters that have been introduced in Liverpool City Centre um, saying, you know, that they were great, something different to try. Um, but at the same time, it's uh, um, a, a kind of replacement for walking for them. So maybe not something that um, we'd want to introduce into areas where you'd want to be encouraging walking from a policy point of view. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and here are just some of the quotes from the non-Northern residents. Um, again, quite, quite interesting. The first one just reflecting that theme around non-Northern residents preferring the longer trips rather than the day trips because uh, transport just takes longer and uh, it's seen as less reliable and less certain. Um, and then number two, we thought this was going to come out at some point. Um, some people thinking the North is a bit bleak, is it, you know, maybe not as nice as it could be, this old stereotype 
Um, so, you know, somebody's saying we should really promote uh, more, that the North is not like that. And there's got so much to, to offer people uh, who, who don't live in the North and might not realise that. Um, and then again, the, the cost of public transport being, being um, you know, just not value for money compared to the car and the convenience of it as well. Um, somebody talking about how that they're often advertised to come visit Wales, but they don't see anything about visiting the North. So that's a bit of a missed opportunity for the North. And um, then again, just something about this multi layers of transport using up people's time. Um, so again, putting people off actually travelling to the North by public transport because of all the changes um, and and the um, delays that they might might face there. Next slide, please. Um, so we are, Matt is going to take us through the stakeholder engagement findings now. Thanks, for Lester C. Um, so alongside our engagement with uh, members of the public, both living in the north and outside the north, we also spoke to uh, a range of stakeholders, I think approximately 40 through four stakeholder workshops and six individual consultations. And they were representatives of a range of organisations, including travel and tourism industry bodies, destination management organisations such as Marketing Manchester and Cumbria Tourism, local authorities and local enterprise partnerships, and also transport operators across all public transport modes, bus, rail, and uh, also highways. Um, we, the purpose of these activities was to understand uh, what their views were on uh, the post-COVID recovery of leisure, leisure travel and what Transport for the North could do to support their, uh, their work and also the, the wider visitor economy in the north of England. And we also presented back to them some of the findings from the, uh, the focus groups of members of the public to help understand their perspective on customer issues. In terms of the findings of these, uh, this engagement, again, like the, uh, the focus groups, we have developed a number of thematic findings. So just to take you through those quickly, uh, that first finding is a notable change in visitor demographics following the first lockdown, with areas now seeing quite different uh, age groups or, or visitor origin points coming to, uh, coming to visit parts of the north. There have been quite a few changes to travel mode preference, travel patterns and destination choice. Um, I remember speaking to a stakeholder from Northern Rail recently. They uh, told me that Sunday is now their busiest day, whereas in fact in the past Sunday was always a very quiet day on the railway. There are historic challenges with industry collaboration and multimodal integration and also inconsistency of the public transport offer. Long term funding is quite hard so it's about to come by so it's very difficult to establish new public transport services with consistency over multiple years. Last mile connectivity is also a challenge for the region. However, on some positive points, uh, there are existing pockets of good practice which can be rolled out more widely. And the North has a very strong natural environment, social and cultural offer, which again could be marketed more widely. Just a few quotes, really, and extracts from uh, the stakeholder engagement. Um, this, uh, this first quote, I felt, really exemplified some of the consistency challenges with public transport. For example, services on some lines, uh, two out of three of the trains might be new trains, and then uh, the third train running on that route might be a much older train. And that lack of consistency is a key barrier, not only to members of the public, but also people who work within the travel and tourism industry and something which many organisations would like to see developed into a more consistent offer. The second quote highlights the changes around visitor demographic, uh, taking the example of the Lake District. They are now seeing people travelling from places such as Birmingham, where historically people would have travelled to Wales from Birmingham, but because of uh, COVID border closures and COVID travel restrictions, people are seeking new places to go on holiday. And also as a result of uh, staying at home and taking staycations, people are looking to explore other places within the country. And people are also now looking to explore harder to reach areas. And those places often don't have the infrastructure. So there's quite a lot of management challenges around that. And then finally, a stakeholder um, suggested that TFN could play quite a key role in helping to bring stakeholders together, helping to coordinate the marketing efforts of the north of England as a collective destination, as opposed to several smaller DMOs. 
um, and particularly so that it doesn't end up in a competitive position, but more on a collaborative footing where uh, everybody benefits from that uh, collective uh, discussion. Thanks, Matt. Um, and then just fi the finally, pretty much our final slide now, initial conclusions and next steps. So um, our secondary research identified the significance of the visitor economy, as you've, you've seen from Matt's slides earlier, um, as a sector in the north of England. Um, and we've obviously got quite a lot of um, numerical data around that. Um, so, so that's one output. Um, but just to focus again on the user and stakeholder research, um, this has identified quite similar themes to each other, including those USPs for attractions for visiting the north, as well as a number of um, you know, barriers that have been identified by the um, qualitative research uh, and improvements that could be made to uh, make the north transport services better serve the needs of visitors, but also the residents of the north as well. Um, so we've just got a few of those findings here up on the slide. So more reliable and joined up services, um, better value for money, um, including transport tickets or um, package deals, um, better provision for active travel on public transport. Um, something that came up quite a lot was this uh, um, desire for bike carriages on trains uh, and also secure bike storage facilities at destinations. Um, and then finally, a more joined up approach across the north on ticketing and marketing of attractions. Um, and I'd also add as well that um, that point John and Joyce made earlier about the need for more collaboration between the combined authorities um, in, in terms of with each other, but also with um, bodies like TFN um, was, was also a, a theme that came up in our stakeholder research. So, yeah, really um, on point there. Um, and then I think we just have a final slide about um, more um, kind of ad admin bits, uh, the, the, the next steps. Um, so we're in the um, kind of analysis and write up stage of the project now. Um, we'll be providing a, a final draft report to TFN by the 28th of May um, and comments will be made by TFN and our, our steering group, those stakeholders. Um, we'll respond to those and then the final report will be submitted to TFN in July and will later be published on the, the TFN website for continued use by stakeholders and also for the public um, and it will be promoted widely to support the implementation of the report's recommendations. Um, so that's us. Um, we've got our um, myself and Matt's email addresses on the screen there if anyone does have any specific questions uh, we'll also be looking at the chat uh, but thanks everyone for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Felicity and Matt. It's a very interesting presentation. Um, I've noticed a couple of uh, comments that have come through in the chat. Uh, firstly, one from Owen uh, suggesting that the need for a One North brand or a visitor campaign around a single brand for the North of England. I wonder if you had any comments based on your evidence around the uh, potential effectiveness of that. I think it would be really, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think it would be really effective and something that is borne out through our, uh, our focus group research, the participant who mentioned about, um, about, you know, visit Wales, you know, obviously Wales is a country, not a, not a, not a region like the north of England. And uh, obviously there is visit Britain and visit England as well within that hierarchy. But then there are also several sub-regions of Wales with their own tourism uh, management organisations. Um, and I think that, that, that particularly the, the strength of that Visit Britain brand and the, the targeting of their marketing uh, was clearly quite effective. And um, clearly for quite a few uh, people we've spoken to as part of this study, having that, uh, that very clear branding would be really helpful. People. Uh, really want to visit the north. They perhaps see it as a place where they'd want to do more of a touring trip and maybe crossing quite a lot of boundaries between different parts of the north and maybe taking in a city, a national park and also a, a market town while they're in the region. And those might be spread over two or three different of the current DMOs and therefore having that more cohesive branding would really help. And also from an industry side, that is something that our stakeholder engagement had shown us would be really welcome, that collaborative approach to attracting more visitors and uh, encouraging them to stay within the north of England would be, would be really welcomed. Thank you very much. And uh, just to, to build on a comment from uh, Kate a little, I don't know if you've seen that in the chat, a comment I think we can very much all agree with on the uh, the North being uh, North being a wonderful, wonderful place for visiting to be. I wonder how significant the perception gap around different areas of the country is 
for the northern visitor economy. And if you have any evidence or intention to explore areas where there is a particular problem around perceptions of the north of England. Yeah, I think that's, again, a really good question. Um, in terms of our secondary or quantitative research, um, I, I don't think we, we picked up too much on, on that. But in terms of the qualitative research and um, asking people who lived in the north and people who didn't live in the north um, about their perceptions and sentiments around the, the north of England and what would attract them to visiting the north, um, we, we, we did get some very interesting um, comments. Um, it, it, certainly those who were non-residents of the north they, they tended to focus on the more um, well-known areas, so the, the rural, the seaside, the big city areas um, in particular. There, there did seem to be um, um, a, a perception that, um, that, that you know, some areas of the north were, as, as that, that quote earlier kind of alluded to, um, still a bit grim, you know, still maybe not a, a place that people who didn't live in the north and didn't know about those areas would come on holiday or come to visit. Um, so, so yeah, that th th there was certainly some of that um, stereotyping that, that continued. Um, I, th I think we, we'll be able to um, provide more detail about that in the in the final report. Um, but you know, there, there certainly were some some comments about um, certain areas. I think Newcastle came up a couple of times. Um, but Blackpool kind of uh, this, this sort of split um, uh, perception around around um, the the um, area around Blackpool. Um, and, and Liverpool as well. So um, again, it's it's it, it's going to be an interesting, I think, journey for some of these places post COVID and whether they can, you know, really market their cultural and um, other kinds of, of offerings to get over those kinds of negative perceptions, um, particularly with the, um, you know, um, staycation visitor economy booming this this year, particularly this summer. Um, so hopefully that will then lead to um, some longer term um, new visitor segments coming to those areas um, and, and maybe not always going abroad or not always going to the traditional places like the Lake District that might already be fully booked out so people have to go um, to, to other places this year. Um, but um, yeah, definitely interesting uh, point around the perceptions. Thank you very much. And if there are any other comments that we haven't picked up on in the chat there, we'll of course uh, share those on with you. But uh, thanks again uh, for your presentation today. As a uh, final couple of comments from me before we end the forum today, just to say thank you all uh, very much for joining us and thank you again for all of our speakers for some very interesting presentations. Uh, apologies for the technical issues uh, which we've experienced throughout the day and I hope uh, you're still able to enjoy our interesting presentations and we'll certainly take some of the feedback that's in the chat uh, on board for the next session with regards to those uh, technical issues. The next forum will be held on Wednesday the 18th of August and more information on this will be sent out to you shortly. We're very interested and keen to hear from anyone attending today who would like to present on research which is connected to our core themes uh, which are summarised on the slide there. We're also going to be sending out information on the development of the Northern Evidence Hub which offers a platform where academics and local policymakers can share evidence and collaborate. If you'd like to get in touch about this, please email us at research at transportforthenorth.com or get in touch with us via Twitter, Facebook or LinkedIn. Thank you all very much again for joining us and I hope to see you at the next forum on the 18th of August.